take their impulse or channel impulse and steal their portrayal, steal their acting out. This is heavy, but if people are afraid of flashbacks, emotional flashbacks, they're giving their flashback to someone else. It's giving grief to someone else. When they give their grief to someone else, they're giving the experience <laughs> away. Because And the experience has pain. That's why people don't want it, because it hurts. <laughs> but underneath the hurt is the impulse. <laughs> underneath the hurt is the portrayal and the dream. If you're smart enough, you could flip around and rewrite the portrayal and impulse and steal their experience or use their experience against them. But this is delusional. I'll probably merge with some psychotic people or something to think that come up with this sort of idea. <laughs> Because emotions are contagious. Yeah. Emotions are that oceanic merge when you have enmeshment, oneness, favorite person, trauma bonding. That's why it's so yummy. If we get good with flow, and we get good with instincts, and we get good with uh, just dropping the story and just going into the raw experience. You get to know the person from their personal pain, and they give it to you. Mm -hmm. They actively give it to you. They actively are giving grief. That might be their special power. Giving them grief. 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 We want to like give back the grief. But it's intimacy. Trauma bonding is my pain connects to your pain. My vulnerability connects to your vulnerability. And then I want to create a language agency, which makes you like own my grief and then try to chase after me or some other bullshit. But if you take away the story, you take away who gave it to who, take away the pity, the pity circle apathy, antipathy, sympathy, take away all that ownership. There is no ownership. It's just life force. Somebody gives you grief, stuck life force, pain, raw pain. They can't, they can't, uh, metastasize. They can't digest it. They can't process this raw pain. And they're owning it from this fucking language of agency. It sticks in them. If you can have the wisdom to stay with the impulse, <laughs> to not think you're a problem, to not try to will mm. yourself through the pain, to not link it to the trigger, that's number three, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> you get the pain here, you try to reverse engineer the trigger, or they tell you the trigger, you fucked up, you deserve this pain. You take the bait and you're trying to will your way through to solve the double bind, which is impossible to solve. And you can't solve the double bind. What happens? You think you're the problem. You start chasing. You start chasing and you treat them like God. You want them there. You want to either destroy the bad God or you want to get the approval from the God. You treat them like God because you, you own the problem. You stay with the feeling and go deeper. If you cannot go into story and language of agency, if you have maybe other people to help you get other perspectives so you can get to the experience. So maybe you don't need to do this yourself. You could use mentalizing. Yeah, I'm not supposed to be on the theme. <laughs> but I downloaded so many people's experiences now and it's like <laughs> spitting fire. <laughs> Yeah.
if you stay with the pain feeling and then you can mentalize and get a sounding board to go into the experience, then you got the pure impulse that's just sitting there looking for creative expression. You got that libido, that, that life force that wants to be acted out for trail. <laughs> Waking dream state. Moving the hand of God. Yeah, this is really psychotic space. Uh, <laughs> yes. This is like beyond grandiosity. This is like <laughs> earth moving magic. I am that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it matches the seven phases of uh, pressure for ICTDP. They'll start from one roll, try to go all the way down to integrate yeah. this stuff. Why not be more ambitious and take other people's feelings and grief and experience and then play with all this free energy everybody's giving out, trying to get rid of? I think that's what you were <laughs> saying last week when you said, I might have a different way to be concerned and to have feelings. Yeah. There's so much more than yeah. just containing your feelings through a personal story, mm. or identity. Isn't that boring? Isn't that stagnant? Isn't that getting stuck in the past and just going living in loops? Yeah. Doesn't that get frustrating because it's so circular? Where was that? It's still circular and there's no way in or out. It's still circular and there's no way in or out. It's still circular. And there's no way in or out. It's still and what's circular. The circle? And there's no disappointed in myself. Disappointed in myself. Disappointed in myself. Disappointed in myself. I'm the problem. In myself. Disappointed <laughs> Always. In myself. Disappointed I don't in have myself. enough willpower. Disappointed in myself. Disappointed in myself. Disappointed in myself. Yeah. No willpower, no impulse, and <clears throat> you're just trying to fix something by going round and round. Because the story is redirecting the impulse. It's not letting the impulse flow through or letting right. the impulse guide you or taking the experience it's trying to shove the experience into a different story <laughs> taking too much ownership of it because you don't know the context of the original wound <laughs> and then you let somebody else define it it's like oh that's off <laughs> no that's not it that's not it. You have somebody else sabotage all the details when you're trying oh, to you, fix the problem. You don't understand. It's the other people. They don't listen to me. <laughs> Perfect example. Mm -hmm. So I'm feeling that one of the impulses can be to be able to go from the first person into just a third person, have a look. So it gets rid of the, the stickiness. Observing ego. Yeah, just not getting the... lost in the impulse. If you mm -hmm. can have enough psychological distance. Yeah, distance. You don't you don't own it to the point you get lost to it. Mm -hmm. You need to like ride the horse. You don't become the horse. Yeah. <laughs> You're guiding the energy. That's moving the hand of God. This is like really off-limits territory stuff. Archons are going to be pissed off. This is, this is dangerous. The Zen masters will <laughs> beat it out of you. <laughs> oh, God, this is good. Wow. Yeah. But Ellie can catch up. Or she's watching as she's delivering her kids or taxi driver or something. I think that's what she had to do. So. Maybe she was the one who helped evoke all this latent impulses. Now that they're stirred around, I can track it a little, play with it. But then everyone's focused on the trigger. So that's the number three. Feelings got stirred up. Pain got stirred up. What's the trigger? <laughs> Number three. 
you attack the trigger. You want to shut down the trigger. <laughs> but if we you can't shut down the it. trigger, there's enough room for it, then you can feel some of the experience and impulse. Hmm. Maybe then you have a chance of getting free from your past, or at least opening a little door to a future. Hard sell. Oh. I love you, man. This is beautiful. This is nice. I can work on this for eight days on the retreat. <laughs> <laughs> Who the fuck knows where I'm going to go with eight days of just sitting with silence. Well, how long a lotus <laughs> do you have to do? Uh, they're only like two hour sessions. So. Oh, that's all right. I can do an hour. I'll try to work up to two hours. I have some cheating props to bind my legs up. Since I, yeah, my legs are bigger, so it's more painful to stay in Lotus. <laughs> All the weight gain from you guys. Or from the four locos. That's good. Oh. <clears throat> so how do I slow down to get into like more basics or are people just flooded or are they curious or both? Or... I'm definitely curious and flooded. <laughs> <laughs> Curious and flooded. Yeah. Do you have any adrenaline? No. I have to work on that. Yeah. We need Holly. Okay. Adrenaline. I'll make note. Amp up adrenaline. Any sparks? Any sabotages? Any... Challenges? Doesn't someone want to shut this down? This is like flipping everything up. This is like outdoing the, the schizoid table flip. <laughs> of fucking out, up somebody's game. This is schizoid. like fucking up the whole Beverage. Infrastructure of mental yeah. health. <laughs> yeah. Fucking up the terror of negative emotions, all that bullshit. The landmines and stuff. <laughs> terror of negative emotions in yourself and in others. Terror of negative emotions in yourself and in others. And then with Terror this mind of field, negative emotions basis, in yourself you have to do and in others. All the way around your own minds. Oh, circuitous so root. root. <laughs> this is codependency, ladies and gentlemen. It is a neurotic drive. No choice, no freedom to serve, to serve, to submit, to fawn, to supplicate. It is Supplicate. a terror of negative emotions in yourself and in others. Those were foundational um, definitions from the early days. What if those are traps? Those are owning the problem. Those are owning the feelings. Those are falling into the double bind. What's the trap? You fall into the trigger. You try to reverse history, essentially. Mm -hmm. You have a feeling. You make a judgment about it, right? You're resentful. You don't deserve it. Then you reverse engineer the trigger. What was this specific occurrence? Or the person who abused you tells you it, so you don't sound like. <laughs> so the trigger is three. 
and then you f fall into the double bind. You don't spot the the illogic or whatever. The smoke and mirror is a context stuff. So then you try to will yourself away out, chasing approval or trying to dump it on the person that abused you. But it's not the pain, it's the story, it's the wrapping paper, the language of agency that caught you in the double bind. You're divorcing. Divorce you and put a story on you. That's a trap, a double bind trap, and then you just get, you're wasting all your energy on a, on a lie on a half-truth, on something that's missing. And when you do that, you end up with toxic shame. You identify yourself as a problem, because the only thing that's a common denominator is I suck. <laughs> I can't get through the double bind. Uh, I'm afraid of uh, emotional flashbacks. I need more self-help uh, books. I need more healing. The therapist is always reflecting back to you. Oh, here's a new problem. <laughs> so you maybe. handle that problem come back i'll give you a new problem no problem i'm here to just throw more problems at you to fix and get paid for it <laughs> and then attachment you disorder i got all kinds of nice words to describe your problem to keep you forever <laughs> doing behaviors that say you're the center of the problem or your mm -hmm. parents is at the center of the problem and you're being born just by having fucked up parents it means you're forever a problem. <laughs> Your karma is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and now your trigger is up to six. And then you start from there and I get up to nine. So the whole purpose is to get up to ten. And then you are in a good place. It's just triggered for life <laughs> any pity point <laughs> and then to try to get out of that loop that's yep. essentially mm. the we the cycles of life just trying to get out of the loops a slightly different framing mm. but that's just getting out of the loop that's not being ambitious I got savage baby here. I got adrenaline addiction. I want to like start moving this impulse and stealing people's grief and just changing the world or something mm -hmm. until I get lazy. Right now, I feel like <laughs> exploring it. But it's probably a lot of work, so I'll probably yeah. just because even uh, I was just sidelines. reflecting on this Indian idea of reincarnation, getting out of the cycle of the, um, samsara. That's even that is sort of like a pussy space. It still doesn't have the dance life force in it that I want to fucking. It doesn't have that original Zen energy, yeah. intensity, yeah. or the Kala Both, Chakra um... arms and stuff. It doesn't have that yeah. Shiva ferocity. <laughs> oh God, yeah. <laughs> it's all this sort of wimpy pacifist yeah. spiritual. Yeah. Oh, I need to I relax see. and not yeah. be triggered. Uh, yeah. And you'd be fragile and hang out with other <laughs> yeah. fragile people. And I think the whole idea of getting out of samsara and... was uh, just so you, you don't want pain. It's, it's basically that. Yes. I don't you get don't want pain. pain. You're giving up experience. Experience, yeah. You're giving up life force or you're fixating mm -hmm. on on a pain that wants to move through you. So you're stopping the pain by trying mm -hmm. to create the illusion you're, you don't want it. It makes a difference. And it just turns into chronic pain. <laughs> Oh yeah. oh yeah that wounded healers and misery vultures just come and feed off of you and sell you courses and... <laughs> i don't care about them <laughs> spin around jesus christ manipulation is more fragmented they're taking advantage of thought disorders fragments of your perception and then the missing part is context. So they, there's context missing. They'll throw out a statement. Where does it fit? Are you saying it? Who are you saying it to? <laughs> what time frame are you referring to? <laughs> what exactly is a message? <laughs> Where is it link? So they so speak you would in have code. To have, so you would have to have forensic evidence and a co-historian to not be fra fragmented, correct? No, they're fragmented. 
What if they're trying they're to infect you with their blind spot? Okay. Gotcha. Because sincere communication is, um, I'm at least trying to play by grammar rules so you can follow. I'm not trying to intentionally try to wear down your mind so you have to use a bunch of mental energy just to keep up. And then even when you keep up, I say you're wrong and just fuck with you. That's not the, the unspoken rules of communication. That's just, that's just uh, being an asshole. Or it's just attacking just... Uh, communication itself. Right? Throwing rocks. Throwing rocks. Because throwing yes. rocks at people is fun because they say ouch. And, <laughs> and you can you know, throw another one and they say ouch. And <laughs> seeing other people cry in pain saying ouch is like a perverse joy that kids have. <laughs> <laughs> Then they'll upgrade and start throwing, you know, darts or something, and they'll go, oh, wow, this is even better. I saw blood. <laughs> Let me start throwing <laughs> knives and shit. <laughs> and they say, oh, I don't feel any pain, because that's part of pain. When you feel it, it hurts. When you see somebody else feel it, you don't feel it. Because <laughs> that's kind of cool about pain. So you can pelt someone with tons of rocks, they cry in pain, and there's bruises, and you don't feel a thing. Mm -hmm. Then, when they're pelted with the rocks and they get angry at you, you can just on you could genuinely say, "I don't know, I don't feel it. <laughs> I it's not fair. I I didn't feel your pain. I don't I don't understand why you're angry at me." Uh, oh, even better! I don't feel it, so you shouldn't be feeling it. Yeah, that's even worse. I'll divorce you. <laughs> I'll or give you a double bind. Or it it wasn't doesn't even me. exist. Wasn't, <laughs> you wasn't misread me. the rock. Hmm. It was the person I'm hiding behind that was throwing the rock. Hmm. <laughs> or it was Rock who was throwing the rock because, you know, Rock is a troll baby. Can't show up to be a troll anymore because I guess he lost his trolling skills. Or you found some better friends, probably. Yeah, we are losers. That's a double rock. Oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, people talk in fragments and we chase. And when we chase, that's called trauma bonding. That's called love. That's called attachment. It's the only way to attach. Chasing, never getting. That is, that is love, yearning for fantasy and chasing and chasing, <laughs> giving up your heart in advance and never getting, because if you got it, that'd, there'd be no chase. <laughs> We're all being trained to chase the dragon. The feeling where it starts declining a little bit, it's declining a little bit, it's declining a little bit. The feeling where it starts declining a little bit, it's declining a little bit, it's declining a little bit. The feeling where it starts declining a little bit. That's like super adrenaline. That's like amazing addiction, addictive qualities. So the pitch is to sort of say that. Not only do you go after context, you learn how to change context. Because <laughs> no one's messing in the context. Everyone's trying to argue which fragment is true. Why would you waste your time with that? That favors the, the thought disorder idiot. <laughs> that favors clueless baby that believes the fragment of reality is true. And of course they can act like an idiot and go with it fully because they're fucking stupid. <laughs> They're operating out of their ignorance of a fragment of reading shit. They don't have a sounding board to actually talk to other people to check their perspectives. In fact, they'll just gaslight other people with their fragment of whatever, add a bunch of story to try to get other people to join this fragmented nonsense time wasting war on shit. Because yeah. they've disconnected from their savage baby and they don't enjoy a good fight. They can only fight like from the shadows and from behind shit and just complain and whine about how much pain they're in.
Yeah. Yeah, this is coming across as too mean. I need someone to soften me. So you're just after um, uh, lifesteal, you know, just pussy lifesteal. Not the oh, real. Maybe thing. that was a trigger. I'm trying to get back at this angst. Yeah. <laughs> Uh. Hmm. So, if you play in the context, you could start acting out different experiences. In a sense, people who are fragmented, they they play pretend, so they are sort of acting the experience of the fake story to try to get you to buy into the double mind, the, the manipulation. Mm -hmm. so. They are trying a little of this, but they're telegraph they're scripting your role to fall into the into their whatever, the repetition, compulsion, transference, all this stuff. So. But you could become a director, a better director. If you have the observing ego to, to recognize that it's just pain and impulse and try to sort out where it comes from. Make sure you don't get caught up in the flood. You don't drown in the water because if you're drowning in water, you have to not drown because breathing water is very painful. Though maybe there's a way to get used to it. I, I, I haven't, I, I suck at that because it feels like I'm drowning and dying. So my body wants air. So. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're flooded by impulse you do have to have some level of distance <laughs> detachment something to <laughs> not drown in the flood <sighs> makes a difference so Sam Backman had like two videos on con on definitions or something. The first one was promising and then the second one gave me a headache. Maybe because William's theory that Fackman is using AI <laughs> is twisting his lectures where he just like wants to humble brag by saying, this person said this, and this person said this, and this person said this. Like, oh, how the fuck is the audience supposed to follow all these different names, and why do I even care? <laughs> Simplify all that shit for me. Don't just throw a bunch of jargon in this person's perspective and that person, and just flood you, flood me, while you're talking about context and definitions. You're confusing the audience. <laughs> the gall of such a person. <laughs> So I tried to simplify his uh, context thing because there were some good points made, but uh, I was zoning out. So this is what I came up with a uh, minute and 47 seconds. A good definition includes a context, context which serves to alleviate ambiguity. Definition must strive to be both it alleviates ambiguity. That means it alleviates anxiety. That means it doesn't add extra blind spots. Because there's enough fucking blind spots in life. So if you're going to open your fucking mouth and say something to find something. Don't add ambiguity. <laughs> Be polite and at least consider some context. That is part of the uh, social contract when you're communicating. But some people don't care. Minima and aesthetic. Definition must strive to be both minima and aesthetic. Minimal, less words, precise, aesthetic, beautiful. So small and beautiful, not verbose and fragmented from every other definition. And extensive and long. And there's no right and there's no wrong. And don't judge judgment, but use your judgment to judge your judging of judgment. It discusses 
the match between language and reality, context. Language is always context determined. Context. Word. So you're using language to describe reality. If you're using language to describe fantasy and just fucking with context, that is insincere communication, which is a great way to try to set up a double bind to dump your grief onto somebody else. Which might not be bad, because if you're dumping your grief onto somebody else, who can take that experience, not own it, steal your impulse and steal your betrayal, they get free life experience without having to suffer the pain. Why wouldn't you take somebody's grief? Very hard sell. But <laughs> if you take away the story, you take away the agency, someone just giving you pain, that's just pure care. That's heartbreak. They're giving you heartbreak. They're giving you lost connection. They're giving you failed boundaries. They're giving you life force. <laughs> Is there a way to build a skill to translate, to neutralize that pain and just turn it into life force? <laughs> to raw experience and steal somebody else's experience? Or you're not stealing because they're giving it to you. So <laughs> Saves you from having to put the effort to get the experience. Maybe you might need to do like 10% <laughs> so you know how to channel the impulse. It's not a free lunch totally. <laughs> and you just got like an infinite amount of free life force around. With people just giving up their grief for free. depend on other words context it is the thinker that does the referring not the expression itself speakers use language to manipulate their listeners into believing in the manifest intentions behind their utterances context you have to believe what they're saying because they're not giving you the context they're describing shit that's divorced from reality so your mind, in order to make sense of what the fuck they're saying, has to give them the benefit of the doubt <laughs> that they're describing something somewhat accurately. Then you can correct it. But in order to digest it first, <laughs> you have to consider it. So you're already mentalizing. You're just doing it sloppily. <laughs> you're already considering what people say when they talk, <laughs> even when it's fragmented out of context. It's just a bad sounding board. It's a intentionally fucked up, manipulated, distorted sounding board that's being blasted at you. That's why we don't And you want to get in sync with it. See, if we don't catch when John talks, we're lost that he said something. <laughs> sounding board, so. Fragmented and we can't help it so stop blaming ourselves that's another loss of the trigger <laughs> we get a feeling and then we see this fucker <laughs> is fucking with me <laughs> then we stick on number three <laughs> how dare this fucker manipulate me off me context <laughs> we get upset about the, the messenger or the message or whatever <laughs> We want to get something specific to latch on to because we're being flooded with a fragmented, out-of-context communication flood, not our incomplete stuff. So we're grasping for specifics. That's how the brain works. So when people say, don't take the bait, don't take the bait, that's sort of the thing. But what do you do with that? Sit with it. Sit with it? Not bad. So that's staying with the feeling. <laughs> and then differentiate it or somehow neutralize it. Maybe John already knows how to do all this stuff intuitively. <laughs> that's how you can channel the tone. Context. Cognitive, emotive, and descriptive meanings all emanate 
from the minds of speakers. Context. It's circular. Belief, language, and meaning appear to be the facets of a single phenomenon. Context. One cannot have either of these three without the others. All in the mind of interlocutors as the sources of both context and meaning. Context and meaning. So it's in the mind of the speaker, but it, then it's also in the mind of the person that's being the hearer. So that's the uh, shared context that makes the uh, fragmented nonsense feel real. Because <laughs> if they're just self-deluding themselves, they don't get that adrenaline hit. They want to throw a rock and have it hurt somebody else and have that person say, ouch, that completes the story. If there is throwing rocks in the air and doesn't hit anything, that's not as much fun. Come on. That's why you don't say ouch. <laughs> oh, you don't say ouch to take away the fun. But if they're good at throwing it, then they use a slingshot. And then they'll yeah. aim at your eye. How do you not say ouch when your eye is cut? <laughs> a lot of practice. <laughs> yes, a lot of exposure. Practice to not say ouch when your eyes are gouged by a rock. Yeah. <laughs> it hurts. Take it. It hurts. Take it. This sounds like it's a will answer. Someone's mm -hmm. trying to will themselves <laughs> to a certain behavior. Acceptance. <laughs> and, and answer. They're not sitting with it like the advice that was given earlier. <laughs> I'm saying I accept it. That is not doing it. That's just saying shit. <laughs> There's no doing in accepting. There's no doing in accepting? Yes, there is. There's being. Are you being what you're saying you're accepting? Or are you yeah. talking from reactivity? It hurts. Take it. It hurts. Take it. No. Why does it hurt? Could How much does it hurt? Shit. Ah, they threw some shit. That's number three, specific example. You said rock. Yeah, no, Holly said rock. Rock is rock. There's many rocks. So, Someone throws a rock. If they're throwing a rock because they're lonely, do you just take the pain and ignore why they're throwing the rock? Yep. Ah, see, that's not looking at the experience. That's just looking at the example out of context. Frank, well, that's weighing it. up the consequences. What the consequences? That's weighing up the consequences. What's the context? There's consequences. What's the context? If you react, there's a consequence. Okay. Within what's a larger context? <laughs> There's a price to pay. Why? There's other people. Why is there a price to pay? Isn't existing a price? Isn't being born automatically pain? Why are you localizing it on whoever is giving you the pain? Because there's others involved. Yes. And why are they doing, why are they giving the pain out? That's their problem. No, it's your problem because you're worried about the consequence. It. If it's their huh? problem, you wouldn't be so harping on follow the consequences and do all the shit because you made their problem your problem and you're trying to make their problem my problem. When I'm trying <clears> to <throat> argue about context, <laughs> you're doing fragmented code. You're acting out what I was critiquing. The circle. Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. Because it's hard to stay with feeling. You said sit with feeling and sit with the experience. Oh, that was pretty good. But then when under stress, you started going up <laughs> to figure out one problem to fixate on. And that's the trap. Come again. Earlier, you said sit with the feeling. That was pretty yeah. good. I gave you some props, right? I, I think I did. So, <laughs> But then when more specifics came out, 
then you started saying, oh, rock, take the pain and consequences. And then you started trying to define the problem and you're trying to guide the will. Whose will? Mine. Yeah. It is. You tried, you owned the story. You fell into the language of agency. This is what everybody does. So I'm not blaming you and saying this is the trap of fragmented <clears throat> communication. Yeah. It's like a fragmented code. The them throwing a rock at you is a fragmented code. So what you do is you take the rock and you go to them and you bend them over and open their ass and put it in. <laughs> and then you say, I totally relate with you. There's no pain. Now, now you've got impulse. <laughs> And you got some agency. Yeah. And they they will thank you to say, yeah, I, I, yeah, there's, there's no pain, but they'll stop throwing rocks at you. They might not be seeing you. They might be throwing rocks at somebody else. They might be mistaking you for somebody else and they're throwing rocks at you because of that. Yeah. They might have got rocks thrown at them growing up, so they're throwing rocks at you because that's their only way of connection. But uh, sticking a rock in their ass, that will sort of, the pain will wake them up. And that's the agency then. Like, see what happens. You could give the rock back to them and then yeah. try to force them to own their experience. <laughs> that is sure. That would be insane in real life. <laughs> that is Pankaj's devour baby. Yeah. Devour baby. Yeah. <laughs> Take off your masks. You so this mask. is a hard argument because we're so used to talking in fragments. And even if we're not talking in fragments, we take a fragment of information and we complete the story. We give an injunction and answer. We try to force understanding where it's a intentionally fragmented communication. <laughs> it's an intentionally small piece of the pie. We don't spend some extra time to sort out the battlefield. game board it doesn't have to be battle. yeah we're not seeing the whole game board so somebody has a game board view <laughs> and they're trying to get you to take the bait somewhere <laughs> and you follow the bait without seeing five moves ahead then it's not a good game strategy why you toss the board in the air and don't play if you can get outside of the game sure But there's actually, the thing is, if you see the context, you see there's no danger. It's just the Leela. It's the play of life. Oh. <laughs> People kind of... are going to hit each other just by existing. <laughs> people are going to cross boundaries and say stuff that annoys stuff mm -hmm. and trigger people. Just that's part of existence. Who escapes that part of existence? <laughs> Where is this utopia? <laughs> That comparison. all these injunctions are there saying, do this and do this and you're free. Well, who has the freedom? <laughs> Who's attained it? There's a hierarchy. Yes, who's at peace? The peaceful. The top of the people in the hierarchy, are they at peace? Are they free? You're shouting these injunctions and these fragmented answers. How do you know they work? Who's satisfied I'm, from it? Hmm? You I don't? Just, then why are you giving us fragmented nonsense and acting like it's, it matters? Wouldn't this also be evidence <laughs> that you're impulsively answering based on a story that you bought into. This is a hard sell. Mental health and all the whatever is teaching people to go up to eventually say, I'm the problem. We're all the problem.
That's not where it ends up for me. Where did it end up with you? Sounds like you're trying to dump your problems on me and the group. That's what it feels like. Is your strategy musical chairs? That That's valid. A lot of people do that. No, I'm pretty contented. Don't... You're contented. What? You're con you might be fine, but it seems like you're taking up space here and I'm not feeling more context. I'm feeling more fragmented talking to you. I'll just shut up. Are you able to? <laughs> Might be harder to do because I'm going to turn up the heat more. We haven't gotten to anything yet. This is just introducing <laughs> the playing field of context versus fragmented thinking. In thinking real disorders. time, yes. In real time. Mm. It's uncomfortable fire, fire. Yep. recognizing how big our blind spots are when Fuck. we take fragments. Fuck. And we take somebody yes. else's fragments. It hurts. <laughs> Zen would say, not knowing space is all good. But not knowing space is fucking torture. <laughs> yeah. Being confused and off balance and doubting, that is not pleasant. Only to you. Yes, it's only to me. All the other people yeah. that were not, yeah, that's, they're oh, just shit. delusions. Yeah. Nobody else is relating to what I'm saying, John, trying to make me all of the problem. Does that feel good? You said you were going to shut up. See how good you follow your own fucking advice? What's the time scale? You want to take me on? Is that what you want, John? No, I respect you. Are you volunteering? Are you going to... Go off, go on camera so we can go. I can see some body language, or you can just keep hiding in the shadows and trying to knock down the messenger. You feel knocked down? I feel that's what you're trying to do because you're not giving me a context. See, just like you're saying, Oh, you feel knocked down. What's the context of what the fuck you're saying? <laughs> what you just said. Uh uh. <laughs> You're supposed to explain context, asshole. You're being a rude fucking asshole. You can deny it. You want me to take a survey? Or you don't care if everybody else thinks that you're an asshole? Come on. Come up with a sabotage. I'm sure it's easy to come up with some nonsense fragment. It's easy to have a fucking thought disorder. It's a fucking disorder. It's a I'm fragment okay. of thinking. It's called like brain damage. That's mentally ill. That's why we're in this fucking group. It's a bunch of mentally ill <laughs> abuse survivors, supposedly. We're no, all going to have thought disorders. I didn't mean to get you angry, okay? John, you fell into his fucking trap. What the fuck? How, are you? How useless are you, bro? <laughs> You're just fucking useless. You're caving to my anger now? Yeah, you can't take the heat? <laughs> you turning your codependent people pleaser stuff on? Come on, I thought that you had more. You stood up to like uh, Nick and stuff and you had to growl. Why can't you keep up with the intensity? I'm lost. Exactly, didn't I say? <laughs> Recognizing the blind spots of fragmenting means you're gonna be not knowing. It's uncomfortable to recognize blind spots of communication. It's uncomfortable to recognize how little context we have in our fucking heads that we need each other to fill in the gaps of context, which is why mentalizing. Look at this great setup for mentalizing. You guys didn't think I could have got there. <laughs> That's why fucking mentalizing is vital <laughs> to, to deal with this blind spot, to deal with this not knowing space that we all have. Not just that we all have, our abusers exploited our blind spots, dumped their blind spots onto us, made us hungry for context, and then we're like downloading the, the crap that we're getting from all the wounded healers and taking that as fucking gospel.
Okay, back to back then. <laughs> ah! <laughs> the mind as a field of potential meanings gives rise to the various contexts in which sentences can and are proven true. The mind is a social relational construct. The mind is both embodied and relational and social. And the context is filled in by that. And if we don't talk out to see where everybody else is, it's easy to fall for the person who's giving us the pain to overwrite our story with their language of agency. Or we blame them as all bad and then we chase and that's still falling for their story. Because we, we have a pull, maybe, that we want context. We can't stay in the unknowing because Zen masters maybe can do it for like five minutes. So <laughs> we're hardwired <laughs> to not like not knowing. We're hardwired to, to not like blind spots, especially when someone like beat the crap out of you from your blind spot. If someone's like throwing rocks intentionally exposing your blind spots all the time, you're probably going to associate that your blind spot is not a good thing. If you grew up all your life and all you know is your blind spot caused your trouble, you're probably going to say, not knowing is a bad thing. That is a reasonable conclusion to come to. Come to. But if your blind spot is potential, is life force, it might have ideas to get you out of your problem. But if you stigmatize your blind spot, you're not knowing. Then you're not going to be able to get out of the loop. Then you get stuck in the double mind. Well, but the more you know about something, the more you know you know nothing. And this is true. The more That's you become... That's a beautiful statement. Me? But are you talking from reactivity? Or are you talking from not knowing? I'm talking from expertise and how that leads to not knowing. And why are you sharing your expertise? Are you trying to persuade people or are you trying to persuade yourself? I don't share any expertise. Huh? Now you're making you're making us feel confused. See, you're, <laughs> you feel confident. You say shit. <laughs> if other people feel more confused, you're dumping your confusion through uh, math. <laughs> so you say confusing stuff. You say it really confident. If everybody else feels blinded and confused, you've actually dumped your confusion onto other people. Through clueless baby, yeah. So, package look, someone's doing clueless baby be better than you. I thought I was a champion, but I I surrender. No, 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 no! I take that. I take that. I take that. I own it. John, it's like this: that if someone is throwing rocks at you, yeah. your solution was, oh, I was standing in the wrong place. That's why I got hit. No, that's, I couldn't move. I wasn't in the wrong place. I couldn't move. You couldn't move. Yeah. Is it possible you're in a bit of a flashback right now? Not at all. Right. You said I couldn't move in present moment yeah. now. You didn't say back then I couldn't move. You said I couldn't move with a present tense energy. From what I heard, did other people hear he was talking in present tense? Same. Yeah. Big time. Are you close. willing to consider, John, that your flashback is sort of filtering your perception? You might be reliving it. Yeah. Okay. And that's okay. We're using mentalizing to talk it out. It's not comfortable. It's a bit painful. It's a bit adrenaline-inducing, but we'll have to check with Holly if it actually gave a hit or not. So. Holy We're letting you use me as a transference object to go throw your answers back that you wanted to when you were getting pelted and frozen. So I'm letting you whip on me back. But I'm trying to provide you context to say, maybe it's a flashback from the past. Maybe you're soothing yourself by giving these simple answers. Is there room for you to consider a bit more context? 
I was just saying there's a blind spot always there no matter how much you know. I thought that's bigger. what I was saying. I was saying it gets bigger. As you, as you know more, the more you know, you know nothing. Uh, and then what's the context of why you're throwing that into I'm the room? I'm into what you said. I'm, I'll just shut up again. <laughs> That might be another flashback if you thought I was directly trying to <laughs> send a message straight to you. This is to a general audience. I don't know your history, John. I know some people's personal history, so I can customize it for that. But I am having to generalize this message. But it does feel like it's directly to you. Because some people could put me on a giant screen and then, bam, I'm in their face. So I need to be careful about mm -hmm. yelling too much. It might terrorize somebody. My teeth are <laughs> something. Through the pixels. <laughs> yeah. Attributed choice of language and in swing justification are rooted in and responsive to both his psychology and his environment, including his personal history. It See? Personal history. So and his environment, including his personal history. That's your flashback. So if someone talks without context or stays in the not knowing space, you fill in the gaps with your personal history. It's because it's probably because the brain is wired to try to make sense of stuff and fill in blind spots. Because you could do like the blind spot test with the eye and they can see this giant thing right in front of your face that you don't see. <laughs> That's a bit disturbing. So <laughs> your mind fills in the gap of blind spots. <laughs> so there's a giant thing within your vision that you don't even see that you don't see. But that would be a side thing. It might disturb people, but I did use blind spots as a theme in the past. So. Just the visual blind spot we have is rather disturbing. Fire, man. You're on fucking or fire. there's like the uh, the the gorilla test and all those like slow change and there's a blind <laughs> something <laughs> changes directly in your face and you don't even see it. Because <laughs> your brain fills in the gap. It doesn't it can't process everything, so it puts things behind. They even had like somebody who's wearing like a shirt. I changed the shirt when the person turned away and like more than half of the people didn't see the shirt change. They even upped it with a different person that was a clerk. <laughs> and more than half the people didn't see the change of clerk. That is how big our blind spots are. That's what magicians do all the time. <laughs> they learn how to, they learn your blind spots and they guide your attention and then they play it in all the blind spots. If you're in mental health that tries to teach you and tell you you don't have blind spots and you know, give you fill in bullshit in your blind spots, they're inflating your ego to set you up for the next manipulator. Okay, your personal history. And his environment, including his personal history. It all starts in the human mind. None of it is objective. None of it is truthful. None of it is meaningful. It's circular. Belief, language and meaning, context. Belief, language and meaning, context. Belief, language and meaning, context. So there's a breakdown of context, belief, language, and meaning. It's not perfect, but it's something that's sort of easier than uh, pretend mode, psychic equivalence, and teleological mode. Those uh, mentalization descriptors of thought disorders are a bit not perfect so 
belief, language, and meaning with mean, meanness as part of meaning. So <laughs> that can be the three ways of thought disorders. And then the trap of thought disorders is that you infect the other person with your thought disorder. So you trap them with language or you trap them that who caves to the meanness person, who caves to the pain, to the moral outrage, or who gets trapped in the thought bubble, the rabbit hole that just sucks up space. So <laughs> a rabbit hole is designed to suck up space. <laughs> so they'll throw a bunch of beliefs to try to capture att attention, but they're just throwing a dominant frame to try to get space. That's it. A simplification of a type uh, bubble belief, bubble mode, intellectual baby. Are you trying to link those to the personality clusters, like cluster A, is the belief bubble? Is that what you're trying to do? A, B, C? Yeah. How did you see that, William? <laughs> Do you see the links between cluster A as belief yeah. bubbles? <laughs> cluster oh, B is... plays with semantics and language. <laughs> Stories. <laughs> cluster C plays with consequences. <laughs> Who's the meanness? The meanest person wins. <laughs> the what's the biggest moral? <laughs> the biggest value system is what means the most. <laughs> That's C. Or I could say C is teleological mode. Yeah. B is psycho equivalence. Yeah. A is a bubble mode. Yeah. Or something. Or oh, um, the same thing: pigeon, fish, chameleon. <laughs> chameleon. Well, yeah. C sometimes is a performance mode. If you're full. <laughs> uh -huh. You get lost in C. Life is just a performance because yeah. it's all about whatever means the most right now, perform well there, then the next meaning and the next meaning. Master chameleon. Thought disorders. I guess we should sort of address it. The three non-mentalizing modes thought disorders, thinking disorders. Psychic equivalence, teleological mode, pretend mode, kind of lower levels of sort of brain function if you create it through anxiety or by stress and so on. And in psychic equivalent mode. Psychic equivalent mode, that's B, that's language. Things become more concrete. Thoughts become facts. I think it, I feel it. It's true. I think it, I feel it. It's me. I think it and feel it. You're all bad. That's language. We get lost in language and then people start playing fuzzy definitions. And the victims and all of us, we have, we're, we're hardwired to sort of, in order to digest words, we have to consider it as somewhat accurate. We can't just, we don't normally just dismiss it like going, this person's crazy or that's up. <laughs> this person isn't sincere right here. I'm going to cut off everything after. That is just not how the brain works. I guess you could try to train your brain to think differently. <laughs> Language is useful. I can't be like second guessing everything everybody says. Like, There's a car about to hit you. I can't like go, wait, let me check. <laughs> There's something falling on me, and a bunch of people are screaming. I, I'm not supposed to doubt the crowd. <laughs> Imagine living where you're just doubting everybody's language. That would... I think it's the time like that you've got to say, the more you know, the less you know, and wait for the car to totally plummet you. <laughs> that works good in theory under yeah. high stress. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, 
So, psychic equivalence. That's uh, B. What's in my mind is reality. I know I'm bad. I am bad. I experience myself as bad. You can't persuade me I am. Everything's bad. Everything's bad. We have actually a certainty in it. So once you begin to be so certain about everything, would you just please question yourself a little bit? Oh, there. How about that advice? How fucking worthless is that? <laughs> oh, you're feeling too certain? Just sow some doubt on yourself. That sounds like an easy answer. <laughs> That's probably time of having some friends who will give you a little bit of a reality check, give you some perspective, <laughs> knock some sense into you. Policing yourself when you're feeling certain and triggered and acting out in a flashback, that, that I don't think that works. Maybe he's right. I could be delusional. I already warned you. Take a step back, think, really? Most things are not a hundred percent. This is... <laughs> that is the advice he gave. <laughs> You're really confident. You're really triggered. <laughs> you want to punch someone's lights out? <laughs> Take a step back and say, oh. <laughs> Thoughts aren't a hundred percent. That will counter psychic equivalence. <laughs> Are therapists this delusional? <laughs> they don't know how the brain works. <laughs> They've never been in a fight. <sighs> that was entertaining. Okay. Next. This is really important in trauma because we could have an experience or an image of something about prior trauma, but in psychic equivalence, that image is current and present and now. It's not yeah. past and then. <laughs> yeah. So I react to it, respond yeah. to somewhere, I'll panic and so on, because it's psychic equivalence. So we call this inside out working. And then there's the projection inside out. I think he honestly thought that you can just check yourself when you're in a flashback. It might work. Go try it. Uh, we tried to check John in a flashback. It didn't work. So, uh, <laughs> might work for everyone else. <laughs> so some doubt when someone's really triggered. It works. Yeah, it yeah. works deep after That's the, the fact. It works after the fact. <laughs> <laughs> yes. After the fact. And then you can blame yourself for not for not being good enough. Being able to doubt yourself when you're fully in a flashback and emotional and acting out. Yeah. That. That's what I did a couple weeks back with Zach. Hmm. Correct. Oh. In his flashback, we tried. Did we get him to break out of it? And to some degree, but. Mm. I think we got his demon to like act out. <laughs> We're playing more with a belief bubble of Zach, but yes, he did have some B also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's playing with words a lot with playing with the context, but he actually believed his bubbles and he wanted us to help him create a bubble. Yeah, that was my trick. Yeah. Was... So we'll get to bubble mode. I think he's, that's the third one. Yeah. The teleological mode. So, so this is C, the meaner mode, teleological mode. This is outside in. So this is what happens out there in reality in the physical world tells me about what's going on inside. So what your mental state is, is really what you do. That's it. And everything's processed in that sort of way. If you're late coming to see me, you didn't want to be here and you don't care about me. Otherwise, you would have been on time. That's it. That's it. So there's a speed and certainty of uh, C mode, teleological mode, because it makes life easy because you got to take action. It's a doing instinctive. It's a faster mode. So it's good performance and good working and, and, and solid. 
A C will counter a lot of A. <laughs> C and a B, it's a bit iffy. <laughs> and if C wants to beat B or A, then you just use some of the other. So you C and A against a B. <laughs> or you use C and B against A. <laughs> or if you're going up against a C, you use A and B. Or you do all three if you're really ambitious. An then you have mentalization. Yeah. You have a solid grasp of reality. <laughs> and then you can actively expose other people's blind spots. <clears throat> We're all hardwired, <laughs> head, heart, gut, to take in information. And each of the ways of taking in information has its plus side and its blind spots. Ideally, you could have a team, so we could be like Voltron, and we want to make sure we have an A, B, and C, and then we can merge together into a robot with a sword and chop off people's heads or something. Remember that. Yeah, it's been a while, so I probably didn't get the metaphor right. I think it was like five things that merge. So I have to go come up with a, a different metaphor of three things that merge together for something. I'm not nerdy enough. I will work on my, my nerd cred. <laughs> so you are what you do. You're not what you say, you're what you do. That's it. He said, you get off your chair, that's aggression. Now, he's reading everything teleologically. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. That if he got up his chair, that means right. he's got an aggressive mind. But the fact that he's, you know, raised his voice and he's prodding his finger and he's doing this, mm. that's not aggression. So they tend to operate on that. That's it. That's it. That's it. The third mode, pretend mode, bubble mode, pretend mode, bubble mode. This is A. This is rabbit holes. This is amazing schizo defenses. It's when the person goes into their own mind and it's untethered to the outside, so it doesn't link. Mm -hmm. okay, so in that sort of sense, it can't learn from another mind, uh, you know, anything like that. <laughs> in that sense, it can't learn from another mind. <laughs> Just in that sense. <laughs> Why did he say it so casually? And from another mind, uh, you know, anything like that, because it's ah, within its own bubble. Because he had the shrug. You got the spot his shrug to sort of that was an extra emphasis <laughs> his frustration with talking to people in bubble mode that might have been the shrug person goes into their own mind and it's untethered to the outside so it doesn't link mm -hmm. okay so in that sort of sense it can't learn from another mind uh, you know, anything right there that was the extra emphasis that you know british people have the stiff up for a lip so you couldn't he's not american so you had to Mute down his judgment to the frustration of bubble mode. It does bother him, too. <laughs> but it was, it was hidden. Like that, because it's within its own bubble. You're not actually grounded in a reality yep. in some form. So your mind actually starts to have unfettered imagination. It can just explain things in the most imaginative ways. Mm -hmm none of which have any grounding in reality. We can think about other people's motives, why they're doing things, and all sorts of things. That's the paranoia side of paranoid schizophrenic, <laughs> or schizoids in general. They're more paranoid. Or cluster bees who have a bit too much schizoid, they're going to have more paranoia because the mind unfettered can think of anybody could be dangerous and then spend all your time obsessing about that. It doesn't ever get tested out in reality. Because it, yeah. <laughs> you don't have mentalization, a good sounding board of other people to help bring you back to reality, to help sort out worthy risk versus non risk. And bubbles tend to be rather solitary. Right, so pretend mode is not going to bring you into a mentalizing relationship no. because you can't build no. connection. Why is he so judgmental about pretend mode? I think he has a bias. Is he a, a white male or something? Is patriarchy? <laughs> Through that, no. it sounds like pretend mode 
is the hardest one it is to sell. Hardest. Ah, there's his bias. Why is it so hard? I don't know if it's so hard. They just need more pain, that's all. <laughs> we just need to destigmatize pain, right? Knock some sense into it, pretend mode. That you're in. And it's one of the hardest for someone else to, as it were, help you get out of it. Because in a sense, the person in pretend mode, you've got to get them really interested in your mind. So if you're in... <laughs> Bro! Look at that fucking advice. No wonder it's impossible. <laughs> you gotta get some rabbit hole obsessed bubble person to be interested in my mind or other people's minds. Fuck. Yeah. He might be in a bubble. Yeah. <laughs> That's not working with the the blind spot or exposing it or using it. That's trying to uh, maybe inf inf superimpose B on A, <laughs> force them into shared language. That therapy is neurotic and B mode bias. Pretend mode and so on. In a way, my mind doesn't come into it. It's kind of not around. And so, of course, I'm not really in there. I'm not in the room. Right there. <laughs> The neurotic is upset that an A ignores him. <laughs> Feels invisible without the shared language and shared yeah, it's story. An injury. The, the ability to just dismiss and reject effortlessly. It really pisses off neurotics. Yeah. Or bees who are obsessed about abandonment, terror, and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I've got to kind of get myself in there somehow, or you've got to let me in somehow. Mm -hmm. So I've got to duck and dive and dodge a bit. The fuck is this boundary invasion? Person has a solid bubble. Why are you so aggressively trying to invade it? That is. Just throw rocks at it. Learn from Holly. Anything that might get yourself there so the person thinks, oh, there is another human being here mm -hmm. today. You've got to get in there. You've got to get in there. And it's only once you've got in. And that might loosen pretend mode a little bit. Could you do a little piece of work and then you may be out again? You have to keep at it. We call it hyper mentalizing. You know, you just start doing far too much of it. Okay. Oh, maybe that's bubble mode. That's the paranoia. Okay, so just beware. As soon as you start thinking you're explaining things to yourself, but it's actually quite complex, I think maybe I'm bullshitting here. We call it hyper mentalizing. Oh, there, there are some like really amazing advice. So if you think you're hypermentalizing and you're in a paranoid spinning state, catch yourself and say, oh, I might be hypermentalizing and bullshitting. That, that coping strategy is like grade A therapy advice <laughs> that comes from a bubble, probably. <laughs> mentalizing you know you just start doing far too much of it okay so just beware as soon as you start thinking you're explaining things to yourself but it's actually quite complex I think maybe I'm bullshitting here we call it hyper mentalizing are you aware that you're bullshitting yourself talking the talk but you're never really walking the walk it's too far in fantasy you're bullshitting yourself nobody else sees me like that so I'm isolated I'm alone bubble mode bullshitting yourself It's hard to mentalize uh, pretend mode schizoids because they're frustrating. So then you create your own bubble as a counter <laughs> to try to socialize them into neurotic shared language. It comes out this way. Mentalizing is hard even for one of the founders of mentalization. He got infected with a thought disorder. So maybe schizoid defenses are really good at infecting. It's hard not to be infected. Go look at this grade A example of a schizophrenic thought disorder. I'll trigger warning, or maybe not. I don't remember.
I think it was kind of non-triggering. That was the disappointing part. <laughs> wasn't enough intensity of his thought disorder, but it was accurate. He was really confused from his describing it. I uh, was in psychosis for about two years. Psychosis, it changes you. Psychosis is oh my, completely a irrational Sorry. thought disorder. <laughs> your thoughts are your own, but they're not your own at the same time. Thought disorder changes you. It's confusing. It feels real to you, whatever you're thinking of. Thought Bubble. <laughs> sort of. Even though it's not actually real to anyone else. Isolated bubble. My thoughts were very dark. 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 Sorry. S quick shifts could trigger some people who have psychotic tendencies. Uh, you were sort of warned. And maybe I'll care. Uh, depends on your story. This is an exposure group. And I'm slowing it down. See how much I care? Dark. I thought I was part of a war of the gods of heaven and hell. Thought disorder. Thought disorder. I thought I... It's very exciting. You're fighting God. You're fighting the devil. You're dealing with a bad God or good God. That's the upside of thought disorders. You're reliving a flashback and you think that if you give the answer now, the right answer, or you get agreement, somehow that's going to change your memory from the past and everything someone magically changes. That's fighting God and devil stuff. It's like, you know, that's the problem of too much bubble. <laughs> the good is too big, but the bad is also too big because there's no adjustment back to reality. I was going to be like the savior or something, or I was being controlled by these gods and stuff. I once had these thoughts, thought disorder, that I thought were real. They weren't real, but they were to me, thought disorder. And so I think when I'm, I have any kind of peace and quiet, and I'm just trying to relax or something, I can't relax or something, I can't relax. Dark or something, I can't relax or something, I can't relax. Thoughts like that kind of creep up. Some part of it, like in the back of my mind, comes up, thought disorder. And I don't like that because it, it was scary for a long time. And I'm so scared of my thoughts in a certain degree because of that. So this is where people that are in extreme schizoid defenses, this is their inner world that they're scared to share. He's able to share with some distance. But if somebody isn't on medication and actively says, oh, medication's bad. And that's part of the system that's out to get me. They're acting out and living their paranoia. They're frantic, frantic to just keep their thought bubble on a certain track. So if you feed them too much reality, you're letting their inner world come to the consciousness too much. When you start getting scared, it's because their, <laughs> their latent fear is coming out and contagioning you. That's where you need to be a bit more mean and uh, <laughs> keep your distance. It's very hard. But if you merge with their paranoia, <laughs> it's two people drowning in thought disorder. Welcome, Holly. We've been waiting for you. We've lost all, all the adrenaline hit. Sorry. We'll <laughs> try to bring up later. <laughs> You're holding. We're on thought disorders. Bubble mode. It was a scary time in my life going through psychosis. Changes you having these dark thoughts. Dark. I can't really be alone with my thoughts. I can't just sit, relax. So what I do is I constantly am doing something. I'll be playing a game, but at the same time I'll have to watch a YouTube video or a comedy TV show. I always have to distract myself because I know thought this why I was left alone with my thoughts. It could get scary, 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 dark. So I've been distracting myself with video games and movies and TV shows since I fell ill. Distracting myself from those scary thoughts that I was having at the time. Say we're sitting at a table and there's other people around. I end up focusing on what everyone else is saying and what I'm thinking of at the same time. Thought disorder. It makes it really hard for me to understand where the conversation is going and what I'm trying 
trying to say. Because... So if you talk to someone whose norm is distraction constantly by watching TV and doing something, so dividing his attention up to try to keep his inner noise from coming up because he'll believe his thoughts because he doesn't have enough sounding boards to mentalize and ground himself with some reality testing. When they talk to you, their norm is to distract. So maybe it's too much of a jump for us in shared language to expect them to speak of any other way than distraction <laughs> and flooding a little bit of paranoia and urgency onto us because they're running from their thoughts. They're running from their demons. Their inner world is unstable. So one shortcut I've done with uh, schizo defenses, I try to get them to pay attention to the present moment with me, stay with me. But not that's not stay with me with beliefs. I'm trying to get them out of their thoughts and into just embodied now. Flood them with sensory input, sort of. It's nearly that's impulse, one isn't potential it? counter. Mm-hmm. Um, impulse. impulse is present moment yeah. and right now. sensory feedback right, that's what JREG does uh, he used like uh, a niacin flush or something so he took a bunch of niacin that made his skin all flush <laughs> and red <laughs> so he's so fucking itchy he broke out of his uh, his mood state, his manic mood <laughs> See? Uh, so if thoughts are the problem and ooh. thoughts are also the, po the positive so you get both sides, mania and negative. You can use something that's sensory <clears throat> flooding to get you out of your thoughts or slow it down. Yeah, it's really jumbled thought disorder. A big issue with schizophrenia is the thought disorder. It changes you, the thought disorder. Things will just get jumbled. Things will just get jumbled, thought disorder. I get completely distracted, like easily thought disorder. No matter how important the conversation might be, not being able to focus exactly on one thing, thought disorder. And instead ending up focusing on multiple things, thought disorder. It's actually annoying when I'm trying to talk to people because I thought disorder. It's <laughs> harder to talk to people when you're constantly thinking about something else, thought disorder. And everything else going on around me, thought disorder. And it is kind of rude to, in the middle of a conversation. I do this all the time. I need to work on that. Be like something to talk he needs to work on that. Like that's gonna catch him when he's doing it. <laughs> What's the why behind the what? Figure out how to address the need or to slow down the thinking, not in an injunction. Because he's lost in the thought, the bubble. Injunctions don't work. Right, and then be like, oh, there's a cat, or there's a squirrel. Oh, look, look at that car. Thought disorder. It's not great. I'm gonna try to work on that, actually. Things will just get jumbled, thought disorder. I once had these thoughts, thought disorder, that I thought were real, thought disorder, thought disorder. They weren't real, thought disorder, but they were to me. Psychosis, it dark, changes dark. you, thought disorder, thought dark. disorder, thought disorder. So that is bubble mode or pretend mode. So you don't need the feelings. Your thoughts and your voices feel real. That's real enough and you get amazing fantasies <laughs> but you also have scary thoughts that torment you because there's no uh, reality testing there's no sorting mechanisms to try to manage it what were we at i guess we're act three Oh, we started early. That's why. <laughs> so bubble mode. We'll go back to ABN. See, <laughs> belief bubbles, language games, and consequences. <laughs> Action. So, C has the upside of speed. A has the upside of space. They can fill the room with 
bubbles and ideas and take up a lot of space, stay on their frame. Abstractions, that sort of fantasy. So C is too fast. It takes one piece of information. That's evidence. And that one piece is extrapolated for everything else because you got to take action now. But if you take C and you add some B to try to get some context, then you can gather more evidence. So then now you're in shared reality. And with evidence, so then C and B can beat out someone who's just lost in stories, trying to impose their imagination onto shared reality with bizarro belonging battles. I did like the alliteration. <laughs> but then C can counter that with crushing consequences and conditions. But <laughs> if B can drag C into the shared reality imagination that's bizarro, then C can lose track of what's happening and get sucked into the bizarro world. <laughs> and then if you use some A, A can like like uh, get you to chase, so they'll create like some belief and thought bubbles and injuries, and you start chasing into the avoidant, and the avoidant has the edge, because they're not just avoidant, they're aggressive, and they can just constantly absent you <laughs> and just say, fuck you. So A's have the, the asshole in your face skill. So if you have A and B, <laughs> asshole in your face, <laughs> with a bizarro world, then you can beat a C. <laughs> and then if you're a C and you want to beat an A, you add like crushing consequences. <laughs> and then you put like a belonging battle in front of the A's avoidance <laughs> and give them consequences for their fucking asshole apathy. <laughs> then they'll have to cave because their, bio their biology, their body, <laughs> like shared reality because you can like get cigarettes and you can sleep so there's comforts that <laughs> that their apathy will, will will be crushed by you just need to amplify discomfort and pain <laughs> and that'll get an, an aids attention and let's see if you want to b to b <laughs> Okay, so if you want a B to B, who's in the language belonging battles, you call out harsh behaviors. <laughs> so you call out their behaviors so they can't talk their way out of it. And then you flood them with uh, a dominant frame story. <sighs> moral outrage. So essentially moral outrage is just combining C and A. That's why everyone uses it. <laughs> Get you to react. Moral outrage. Beat the crap out of you. So that's CNA. <laughs> and the, and A that voices you with a dominant frame. <laughs> have and you, C uh, is a punishment. <sighs> William. I, I'm sorry. But uh, have you... There's a lot of Marxist literature that's basically just about that, which is B to C kind of dominance. It's like, you know working class Bs dominating the Cs. How do you do that? And there's a lot of literature on that. I don't know if you've read it, but this is really interesting. Um, They probably hacked um, motivation, yeah. <laughs> a lot of this uh, Marxists and social justice warrior tactics, they're using a lot of these buttons. So. Oh, let me put this in the chat. If I can find it, or maybe not. I'll do it later. You can do a screen cap. These words don't matter anyways. But. We're, we've been covering this in different framing. This is just a slightly different framing, different order. Like disown, deny, and repressed. So <laughs> cluster A's, they dissociate. <laughs> they disown stuff, and then they can use their stories to 
cover up shit. Though they more disowning and denying, so that's where they have the rejection. Cluster B's and neurotics, they're in the denial split, so they're always splitting things of safe group, not safe group, tribalism, the blame game, drama triangle, masters of negation. And then a cluster C, or the teleological mode, that's, you know, harsh judgment, one behavior, policing, that's the... the the harsh defense. So it's a superego that sort of merged with being or something. That's a good worker, good performer. And then a B is lost in transference and projection. And it's a lot of fun merging with stuff. Now I put acting out here, so that's because I was talking about other stuff. <laughs> Actually, wait, if a schizo defense person is highly paranoid, they act out. So yeah, that probably is still technically right. And that's why they're scary, because they'll act out from their delusion <laughs> and do crazy shit because they are divorced from reality. And then they're they can flood and then neurotics cluster B's they're fighting and then cluster C teleological that's performance mode chameleon Hawkage mentioned that right oh. so there's a Three thinking disorders. I gave one example of bubble. Counters I sort of covered in the pre-meeting are the ultimate counters. Steal someone's experience and their impulse. Turn it into a life force. I'll have to work on that in a future meeting or something. Because I don't want to hurt people, I started thinking about how much unintentional. Oh, case study. I don't mean it, but <laughs> this will crush a cluster A. <laughs> unintentional damage. Temporarily. My resentment for the world and my hatred for feeling like some outcast or alien in my environment how much damage that could have done to somebody that was undergoing their own set of trauma and tribulations under a similar environment as myself. So this is a, also a good teaching example for people who are more neurotic than bees or codependents who also probably carry a lot of resentment. So by divorcing yourself or being divorced, not being able to express your needs and set your boundaries, there's a lot of resentment. So then when somebody triggers the resentment or somebody reminds you of a figure of the resentment, then you'll act out the resentment like he did. Then you have to use it for him. You have to use a bunch of words to say stuff. So you don't feel any feelings. <laughs> Except then you get drunk in the middle of the night after hearing a uh, shadow fall story and my stories of trying to plant some seeds. And then you have uh, this behavior he describes. Because their version of it didn't make sense to me, I discarded it. I discarded it. And I, I was so worried about avoiding my own suffering that I kind of sort of abandoned those kind of ethical duties that I've kind of really, really felt are now important to me as I'm older. <laughs> That is uh, uh, absencing, right? Where was it? Oh, there. Apathy and absence, that's ag aggressive. But then perceiving himself as being an asshole, 
it bothered him. Unfortunately, schizo people are still human. So they toil with being human and they don't like it, but they still have to occasionally feel human feelings and then come up with all these words to try to stretch out all the emotion because you can't contain it. They're using too much bandwidth and beliefs and rabbit holes. They're not building their muscle, feeling feelings, intense feelings, channeling impulse. It's all dissociation and distance and rejection, dismissing. I actually ended up drunk texting my sister apologizing because I was just so devastated by, and I failed in that thing. One of the things that I think helped me cope was I would blame it on to some degree on my youth, but I couldn't do that after you said that story. After you heard a story, so that's Cluster B, a story connected to him, he saw the links. <laughs> oh, I was an asshole. <laughs> Oh, I'm drunk. I'll drunk text. I'm sure the sister probably didn't think that was uh, equal. <laughs> oh, I finally have my brother drunk text me apology. <laughs> well, I couldn't exactly run from the demon in my head, so I didn't really have a choice. The show was rough to hear. It's been uh, a brain worm in my head for like a little bit now. I just hate it. Right there, there's a clue. So if you're dealing with someone with more schizo defenses, plant a brain worm in their head. But you need to understand their pain points to try to customize a meme or some infection to get them spinning inside and sort of imploding inside and then watch the slow... <laughs> uh, Inner torture comes out, come out a little. I still have to figure out a better formula, but that's sort of the, the roadmap. Did everyone and everything? I did that too. I blamed them oh, as no, long as I, I could. But I, I, I hated, like I couldn't let go, and I still can't let go in many regards for my hatred of the manner in which human society oh. has progressed. I might have heard. His hatred of the manner that human society progresses. I didn't know that hating the way society progresses actually has any influence on society progressing or not. Is there a vote that society's progression is taking that if you hate it, somehow that influences society's progression? Or is this a logical thought bubble or something? Uh, Apparently, he doesn't care about the logic. A lot of people that I never intended to hurt. A lot, with my, with that admission. <laughs> in which human society has progressed. I might have hurt a lot of people that I never... Oh, I might. I might have hurt a ton of people. <laughs> and didn't even mean it. Maybe I might have happened. I'm not going to investigate, because that would be, like, shame-inducing never intended to hurt with my complete indifference and isolation. Oh, he's blaming on, on indifference. Porcupine sort of dilemma is they, they kind of feel this like weird loneliness and then they reach out and they think they find something and then ultimately that person that can't give them what they want and vice versa and it just ends up being like more pain for both parties. Both parties or have pain. a misunderstanding or a miscommunication. Is the pain equally caused, or is his indifference maybe causing more of the pain? Or does he not know math? He's not doesn't have like this constant evaluator of subjective beneficial exchange. <laughs> his deficiency. Some people might have that. And as to what the other person's needs are and how they can be balanced or met. It's, it's fucking grim. Their version of it didn't make sense to me. I just guarded it. Unintentional damage. I don't want to hurt people. Their version of it 
didn't make sense to me, I discarded it. I discarded it. I discarded it. Oh. Making cluster A is too scary. That was a random button click. That wasn't the plan. But... Huh. <laughs> Okay, let's go sell something. I gotta try to give you an aim. Part of the pitch is to combine C, B, and A. So if I give you a pitch, it's a persuasive attempt to offer a context of some combination of language, belief, and meaning so that you can have an incentive to work hard to try to mentalize and get context, search for a deeper purpose and meaning. And maybe one of the things that's missing is a place where you can relax into tender mode. It's a bit of a jump. Since we've recently dived into tenderness, baby, people who are codependent are chasing after fixes and owning too many problems. Is there a place where you can rest your head and just be and accept attention or state your needs and wants and, and not be threatened by it? Is there a way to destigmatize that? Maybe I'm not, our discovery of tenderness, baby, isn't something new. Maybe it's also part of something called subspace, which isn't the easiest reframe, but. <laughs> <laughs> if you're littles, need some discipline and parenting maybe they need a safe little space to play a safe space for your inner children to express their needs and that's explored in bdsm through subspace but it's also how uh, ratting or pseudo submission is often what's role modeled in therapy it's role modeled in support groups this promotion of a rebellious attitude to take what you need and set boundaries and not see people if they don't give you what you want leave them first that's pseudo submission that's brating that's what we're teaching people that's what therapy and wounded healer, healers are teaching people when they're saying teaching setting boundaries So this is a clip of Miss LX's recent video on pseudo submission. The guys to control and manipulate their way into getting their fantasy. A pseudo submissive, someone who claims to be submissive but is incapable of surrender because they're so focused on obtaining their own relationship desires and fantasies. So I think, uh, who argues for the benefit of surrender? Who argues for adaptive surrender? Surrender is almost like a bad thing. Even though everybody gives everybody super ego injunctions that they want them to surrender to. <laughs> Here's a fix, listen to it. That's essentially trying to get you to surrender to somebody else's authority. And then they cry about attachment disorders. But if you have healthy surrender, <laughs> that might be fundamental for intimacy or attachment to discover yourself. But what are you surrendering to? You're surrendering to a safe space or a safe enough space that you built trust with that you can be yourself. 
So maybe it's surrendering to a lot of your impulses, but you need a space, somebody else, or a group that allows yourself to let your guard down, let, let down your masks, and see what your natural attachment is. And then one of the biggest things that's policed is rage and anger and spontaneous expression. So that's essentially passion. And when passion is suppressed <laughs> and exiled, it comes out in sideways perversions and distorted ways. And then it comes out as mania, as crazy passion, crazy desires, because it's just unskilled devotion, because when you're in mania, you're sort of obsessed. If you learn how to channel your passion with a proper self space, then you could turn your mania and passion and desire into devotion, where both parties are devoted to the good of the, of the collective of the pair, of the other, where there's joy of just this other person being happy, getting their needs met. So then you have a combination of playfulness and proper touch, erotic intelligence, tactical, tactical, tactile, tangible, love in, in physicality. So combination of surrender and devotion, and then also commitment and investment. So with commitment and investment, that builds trust. The investment and commitment takes time, and it takes personal sacrifice, and it takes the other person and the, whatever you're trusting in performing over time, so you trust it. So the pragmatic side of love is investment, is trust. You get a combination of all this stuff, then that could be a metaphor or an equal pointer to subspace. But if you're a fake submissive, could be a fake rescuer, could be a wounded healer who wants to feed off of their other people by faking rescuing because they're incapable of surrendering to the greater group. They're incapable of surrendering to context, shared reality. They're incapable of surrendering to trust. They're incapable of letting their guard down. It's their desires and fantasies and Anything goes, as long as they can avoid punishment. This is the mentality that leads to treating your partner like a dispenser. dispenser. So you treat everybody like a dispenser to get stuff or throw trash in. Then you can complain why other people attack you. And everyone has this. When we're defended, we're going to be acting out of our flashback. So we're not seeing other people. We're acting out of our harm. We're relieving our flashback because we don't have a space that allows playing out a safe subspace to sort through all these unresolved needs and wants. We only know how to get our wants by indirectly asking for it. We don't know how to articulate. And we don't know how to articulate it because <laughs> we've been divorced. <laughs> so the language and the trust to speak our needs and wants isn't there. And the comfort level of recognizing our needs and wants might take time. Some might be delusional. There's a lot of details in shared reality that you need a space to practice in. And it's hard to trust a subspace or a leadership or a group or trust other people. So we use passive rebellion. Often this mentality is driven by a desire for control 
and a subsequent manipulation in the relationship. They may use the idea of submission to gain power over their partner and meet their own needs. So if codependents can't meet their own resentment, they aren't processing that, they're stuffing it, then that resentment comes out as uh, submissive control, as <laughs> mask helping to try to get supply, control attention, control transaction. It comes out of lack. But the lack is because you, can't, you don't know how to get your needs met otherwise. It's just, can't help it. And obviously, this mentality can harm the relationship as it's not based on mutual respect and collaboration, but on one person, the pseudo submissive's selfish desires. By producing a one sided agenda, the pseudo submissive is putting pressure on their partner. Where you so it's trying to do the best of best both worlds. Submissive plays submissive, but gets the ability to put pressure on the dominant, and the dominant has to take the responsibility. <laughs> the submissive is making the demands. If they're making the demands, they should take the responsibility too. But instead, they can just go cry foul and make a bunch of stuff and then put the blame on somebody else. feel this pressure to fulfill their needs, which can lead to a strained connection hitting you against one another. That's a pity circle. That's the tribalism. That's the splitting. It's, it's a position of rebellion. It's a schizoid defense, essentially. But if you go the route of schizoidism, you're alone in your bubble. Fighting against your biology, it's a tortured experience if you are successful using that strategy. Fragmenting. Rebelling against society and humanity. I can relate. I mean, society is very oppressive, and I want to do that. But I also... It takes a lot of work for me to do that, and I don't see the payoff. But. Maybe if I was more schizoid, I could dismiss people and feed off people and enjoy it more. I'd rather be savage in front of people or something. I don't know. Maybe I'm too much of an adrenaline junkie. So. The pseudo submissive uses the DS dynamic to get what they want rather than seeking a mutually fulfilling agenda for both partners that will benefit the relationship as a whole. See, for both partners that benefits the relationship as a whole. That's we. <laughs> How, many, how, how much passion can you have without a we? Don't you need somebody else? <laughs> how manic and mania and desireful can you be without someone else? You need a we. So can we work at getting better at weeing, at devotion of playfulness and touch, learning these skills so that we can enjoy some passion instead of living passionless, boring, dull, depressing lives. Is this worth investing in a little to learn a language of stating our needs and listening to other people's needs and trying to make the we a little better? It's a hard sell. Sabotage and Throwing rocks is much more fun. Ooh, 916. Gotta wind up somehow. The contrast to this is when a submissive approaches the relationship with mutual respect and a sense of collaboration as they look for mutually fulfilling ways. Build a bridge. They approach it with a desire to explore and connect with their partner in a way that's fulfilling for each of them. 
This sort of requires mentalization. It requires patience to learn how to voice your needs and wants and discover that your, yourself and to help the other person find a voice, maybe be a co-historian for them and they can be a co-historian for you. Or Zoom could be a co-historian to help rec record and track stuff so you can learn how to voice, <laughs> reconnect to your voice to express your needs, discover your needs, discover your needs and wants and everybody else's so that it's fulfilling for both parties. By producing a collaborative agenda, the healthy submissive is encouraging both partners to explore their desires in their own way, in their own way. The this is harder now. So now you have to not only mental, you have to talk and mentalize to try to figure out what their own way is, <laughs> giving them space to have a different way of uh, expressing their desires or feeling their desires. This might cause a headache. This might be pressure to splitting. <laughs> so much easier to be merged with somebody else and you both have the exact same desires and all this stuff. <laughs> and the language is easy. <laughs> Just magical, like a romance novel and they both know each other and all the moves are perfect and there's no hitting each other or elbows accidentally stuff. None of that happens in fantasy. <laughs> That's why fantasy is great. <laughs> you don't have the fucked up playfulness of <laughs> mistakes and <laughs> practical issues. Own <laughs> way, in their own way. The more you bombard them with books and videos and courses and learning materials and play ideas, because and injunctions and tips and fixes. Because your sub frenzy is unregulated and sub frenzy, that's a nice term. <laughs> insatiable, it will make them feel less dominant and further reduce your chances of subspace. It's a lose lose. You make the other person feel unworthy <laughs> and you're more demanding. They do the same thing back to you. You feel unworthy and it's just a support group of everyone feeling toxic shame but not saying it because they're validating each other with lies but they're all acting out you're unworthy you're unworthy i'm unworthy it's fucked the healthy submissive is interested in creating a dynamic that is fulfilling for both parties rather than using their submissive role as a means of subtly undermining, undermining and manipulating to gain power or control. Undermining. So have you been there as a dominant? Feeling like you're trying to be open-minded and learn and slowly explore, but it's never good enough. It's never good enough. Like no level of play can satisfy your submissive. It's never good enough. Never good enough. What was that? No! 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 Ah! No! Just keeps moving the target. Like you no longer have the right to be a human being with needs and desires. It's never good enough. Like there will be big problems in the relationship if you don't keep up with your submissive. It's never good enough. These are all signs that a pseudo submissive has been covertly manipulating, undermining. Use the idea of submission to gain power over their partner, undermining and manipulate their way into getting their fantasy, getting their fantasy, getting their fantasy. The thing is, it doesn't work. They have to keep manipulating to get the fantasy and they're not getting the fantasy and they're chasing an unattainable love addiction, sex love addiction by trying to manipulate, but there isn't the space to make it come true. There isn't the playfulness. 
and there isn't the proper touch because you have to get feedback back and forth and you have to be able to communicate. The other person needs to say, ouch, you got to be able to say, ouch, you got to adjust so you aren't banging elbows on each other's head and, and choking people by accident. I mean, <laughs> just the basics of not hurting each other is hard. <laughs> then how to give the right amount of touch that feels good for the other person. This takes a lot of back and forth mistakes. If your boundary is like, I don't want to get hurt ever again with any sort of passion, someone's going to step on your toes. If you cry foul and say safe space, uh, whatever, when things get too hot, you'll never get passion. You'll never get your fantasy anywhere close to actualized. It has to stay in fantasy. So there's this chart and then it's also this chart. So you have to be able to go alongside <laughs> parallel the emotions and not fall into inner critic pity wars and anxiety <laughs> to ground yourself and go into the feeling, into feeling, stir up some emotions, which is essentially passion <laughs> you got to let passion flow a little before you can sort out the differences and the needs and how where to spend your time devoting and how to pace yourself because if you train yourself and then you fail I mean, fantasy will sometimes want things that are delusional You have to evoke and stir up the emotions and you have to go watch and observe and make space for that. Then you gotta, this is where the doubt comes in. What's actualizable? Is it my desire? Is it the other person's desire? What unmet needs are there? Where's the why behind the what? This takes work. It takes questioning. And then to understand you start talking out the perspectives because you can't mind read or I can't maybe you can keep trying that good luck with that <laughs> you got to communicate the perspectives and then tend and befriend to try to find the unmet needs sort them out prioritize them this is kind of nerdy but this is kind of practical people don't like that maybe then you attend and care for the needs. This is maybe tenderness, baby. Tend and befriend opens up tenderness, baby. Then you're attending and caring for the tender needs and you're being in service, <laughs> care and service. Then you get like energized creativity and stuff. Libido, life force with my crappy light bulb. Nine twenty five. Was that an ending? That was a bit too much of a judgment thing. Oh, do I have something more that wouldn't open up new doors? <laughs> I don't know how this will land. Let's see. This is from an audiobook. <laughs> I came from the big, exaggerated world of community theater, so my acting was presentational, cheesy. Rather than feeling my character's emotions, I indicated them in an effort to impress my teachers with my understanding of the scene. The teachers were unimpressed. They didn't care about hard work or character analysis. They wanted blood. Love. Get the fuck out of your head, my acting teacher screamed at me. My fellow company members yelled it at me, too, 
Get the fuck out of your head. Yeah, that's her. We scream that phrase all the time at ourselves, at each other, at the goddamn walls. Passion. The screaming wasn't hostile, but more of a rousing battle cry. Like rousing that of an athlete cry. rooting for her teammate. Me. I was screamed at for not going deep enough. Too cerebral. Or for Scream trying to go too deep. Pushing. We wrote fierce quotes all over the studio walls and chalk. Be real. Get the fuck out of your head. Go deep. An ounce of behavior is worth a pound of words. So that's challenging and it's an aggressive form of trying to evoke motion. You gotta stir up the feeling to identify, to help sort out the memory. Oh, because part of the issue is your flashback and your defenses. They're congruent. They're not fragmented. That's why they're so rigid and solid and they come back. So you have your flashback. It has a behavior, the trigger. It has a story, the person who abused you or whatever. You're going to project that on a new person. That's going to be linked. And it's going to have a belief system, a language of agency. All those three things are linked. And it's going to make total sense when you're re-triggered. A, B, and C. Your belief, language, and the meaning. And your defense is so good, it's going to get the other person to do the same thing that the past story did. Because A, B, and C are linked. They feel extra strong and real because that's why it sticks around. That's why it's a good defense. And it's hard for you to counter the defense or somebody else to counter the defense because they only have a fragment. So it's a fragment versus an ABC solid memory. So only somebody who cares about you enough to try to build a counter ABC to contrast your flashback, your defense, to sort of weaken the the fixation or the, the solidity to break it up so that it can be integrated. That might be the only chance. You need a relationship with somebody who knows you to, who can at least sow some doubt healthily to challenge and mentalize of your defense and not try to attack your defense is all bad because that's also validating the defense. Nobody understands. That's part of the belief bubble. That's a schizoid defense. I have a belief, language of agency, nobody understands. The only way somebody understands is falling into my bubble. Good luck with that. So question, is that what Zach was trying to do with us? Drawing, getting drawing us to scene. fall into his bubble or just yeah. getting us to help him distract? I think the latter. Mm -hmm. Distract and then also if we could like give him validation or fall into his dominant frame, that's a bonus. Yeah. So I got triggered as a result. And you started acting out. Yes. And you validated his ABC. <laughs> Defenses are tricky. You got to keep psychological distance. And you got to sort of probably honor them. You can't take a defensive posture against a defense because it validates the defense. Okay. Ultimately, you need to love the defense because the defense means there was something very important in the past. Yes. The defense needs a new story an updated map of the story and a safer space to be expressed to find the unmet need, address the unmet need, defense is no longer needed. And if your defense is giving you an adrenaline hit, you'll probably need to get an alternative adrenaline hit because adrenaline feels good. We're not here. I'm not here to shit on adrenaline. <laughs> I guess I did at the time. 
or dopamine or any of the neurotransmitters. I am not a, a killjoy because my mom was one. So I'm, it's tough for me to kill any joy. <laughs> if someone's feeling good, getting some desires met, and it's not harming anybody, why not? Be happy. No, be passionate. Be passionate, playful. Risk getting your heart touched. Enjoy some affection, attachment. Be more wholehearted. Oh, I might have a video on that. Ha ha. It's not perfect fit or it might be. Superficial behavior modifications, do this, don't do that, to keep people in line, it never works. Shaming people for their bad behavior never changes the heart. Out of the overflow of the heart is where behavior comes from. Telling someone, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, to shame them out of their bad behavior that doesn't make them change their behavior do this don't do this it often makes them hide their bad behavior better them hide, hide their more. bad behavior better and it certainly doesn't change the heart i want to get to the root that's why i speak in roots and principles and why behind the what your heart is beautiful it was just a little misdirected and so if you want to be better for him then the way you do that is you surrender and you trust. You trust that Subspace. he doesn't need you to predict. He's secure enough to be an adaptable planner. He doesn't need you to do his thinking for him. That's controlling. Trust that he doesn't need you to predict. Out of the overflow of the heart is where behavior comes from. The heart. The heart. Where is the fucking compassion to just say, wow, you know, that's what's going on in her world. Where is the fucking compassion? Where is the fucking compassion? Where is...